Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. It's The In Show, Australia's only show dedicated to innovation from Adelaide, Australia and across the globe. Hi, this is David Grice from Troy Simcock and we're talking about people with great ideas who are really making them a reality. You know, the challenges they've faced along the way, the people that we refer to as innovators, entrepreneurs, startups, and they really do end up making our lives better, David. They do and inspire us as well. I think uh, that's the most important thing about what we're, we're learning here on The In Show is that the inspiration we're getting from all these people. And talking of inspiring, you went out to the RAA, the Royal Automobile Association. This is a business with a very long history and they probably thought back then that things are going to be a certain way for a very long time. Things have shifted dramatically for them. Do you know, it's really interesting because uh, when I did pose that question to them about the fact that, you know, is it just now that they've been innovating or has it been all the way through the journey? When you hear the story of the of the history of this organisation, they have been in innovation the whole time and it's absolutely outstanding when you hear the stories. Well, things are evolving at a rapid rate and you catch up with uh, some people from the innovation team. Yeah, on the show today, we're talking to Penny Gale, who's the General Manager of Engagement and Innovation, and Ben Flink, who's the Senior Manager of Business Innovation. And they're talking about a new initiative in the premises itself called the Innovation Station. Now, they've renovated the building, they've moved reception, they've created this space where people can actually come, collect, gather and share ideas. And we're also talking to Mark Borlace, who's the Senior Manager of Future Mobility, and he's discussing his new role, which is a brand new role in the organisation, focusing on innovation, policy, and the role autonomous vehicles are going to play in the future. Well, now here's Claire with more in news, including a story about how recycling your electronics could become less complicated and confusing. What else have you got for us, Claire? Thanks again, David and Troy. Well, this week we'll be talking about mysterious radio waves in outer space and how recycling your electronics is about to become a lot easier. But first, this year, renewables will officially become the world's cheapest energy source. Now there'll be no financial excuse as to why we can't ditch non-renewables like coal to help the environment. Wind and solar energy production in particular will become cheaper, which means those who care about the profit as much as the environment will turn to renewables. It's even been predicted by engineering consultant Arab that in the UK, the cost of wind energy production will be less than natural gas. Some experts are calling it an investment opportunity that is guaranteeing long-term success and stable returns. This shift means there'll be lower energy storage costs for companies sourcing renewable energy. Plus, this has benefits for disadvantaged and impoverished countries. For example, people living in Africa will no longer have to spend about 16% of their income on power sources, including disposable batteries or kerosene. With climate change gradually worsening, it's good to see taking care of the environment is becoming more more financially viable. A group of astronomers think they're one step closer to explaining where mysterious radio pulses from outer space came from. Previous explanations for where these bursts of radiation come from include exploding stars, gravitational waves and even beacons on alien spacecraft. Now researchers have developed a theory based on observation about where the fast radio bursts, or FRB for short, originate. It involves a neutron star that swiftly rotates and is surrounded by an almighty powerful magnetic field. According to astronomer Jason Hessels, who was involved in the study, the star could be just 10 to 20 years old. FRBs were first discovered in 2007, but were dismissed as data glitches. As only one burst has happened repeatedly, they've been difficult to locate and study. In our Milky Way galaxy, the only supercharged magnetic environment exists near the black hole located in the galactic centre. Despite this new finding, astrophysicists will be keeping their their minds open to other possibilities, aliens could still be to blame. Recycling your electronics could become less complicated and confusing. The United Nations estimated that last year over 45 million tonnes of e-waste was produced. If electronics are mishandled or disposed of incorrectly, the toxic components can have a seriously harmful effect on the environment. At the moment, Europe, Japan and Korea are the best e-waste recyclers as they have a system called Extended Producer Responsibility. This means the producers are responsible for making sure their devices don't damage the environment. But it's not enough. 
In 2016, almost a quarter of electronics in the UK were chucked out with general household rubbish. Usually, the easiest way to dispose of electronics is to drive down to the local dump or to your nearest retailer if they take back old products. Now, customers are asking for easier ways to recycle their products. And recyclers are urging companies to start producing devices that are easier to take apart as things like LCD TVs are fiddly and take a long time to dismantle. Hopefully, the process of recycling old electronics does become more straightforward. The future of the environment depends on it. And that's what's in news this week. Thanks, Claire. Well, David, I've got to tell you, in my neighbourhood, hard rubbish is like an everyday proposition. The amount of electronics I see out on the side of the road is extraordinary. And, you know, so much so that they've actually put a sign down the end of the street saying, do this and we're going to fine you. It hasn't stopped people at all. <laughs> Have you seen anyone get fined yet? No, but the, the reality is people just don't know what to do with them. And so, mm. you know, the, you know, having a TV in your bin, well, you know, firstly, it probably is not going to fit in the first place. You're not going to take the time to break it down. So it makes a lot of sense to have these items be able to be recycled. It does. And and look, I mean, I've even got still, I've got two or three of the old television sets and they're sitting in my garage collecting dust, doing absolutely nothing. And, uh, you know, what do you do with them? Well, what is the thought? Why are you keeping them, to be honest? Um, seriously, because I don't know what to do with them. I, I, you know, there's there's nothing sentimental about them. It's just what do I do with them? Where do I take them? And, uh, and that sort of thing. So this is, uh, this is a really, really great thing. Are you aware of anywhere in the world where they're, you know, they're spearheading how to take care of items like this? Yeah, look, I mean, I've seen a, a bunch of things around reusing mobile devices, you know, particularly in, in remote regions in Africa and things like that. And there's been a bit of press recently on, on that particular thing. But, um, you know, go to, down to Ikea and Ikea have a recycling place for mobile phones and things like that within there. Um, so I'm wondering whether, you know, these retail giants of the future will end up actually being a place where you can take those things. That's a great idea because, to be honest, I don't think I've been to a dump since I was in primary school and that was a long time ago. Mm. It's not It's not something, you know, people want to do. We're in a world of convenience. And so with the amount of devices we're consuming, that needs to be easier to get rid of them also. Yeah, absolutely. And and even getting to the dumps themselves, um, and, you know, you've got to have certain specifications around trailer sizes and different things like that as well. So I don't have a trailer. I don't know where my dump is. It just seems like a whole lot of hard work. <laughs> It sure does. David Grice and Troy Sincock, we're talking innovation on The In Show. You can check us out at theinshow.online, Facebook, and follow The In Show on Twitter. Coming up, we speak to the RAA, the Royal Automobile Association, about a new initiative at their premises called The Innovation Station, focused on creativity and thinking differently. The In Show, it's all about innovation. Hi, I'm John Carroll from Sphero, and you're listening to The In Show. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock, and if you've missed an episode, make sure you subscribe to the In Show podcast on iTunes. The In Show. All right, David, we're talking to the RAA, the Royal Automobile Association. You went down there during the week. Now, this company has a long history. Yeah, 114 years to be exact. And, uh, you know, what they're doing around, you know, innovation and getting things sort of prepared for the organisation to move into the future is unbelievable. So, Troy, during the week, I went down to the RAA, to the Innovation Station, and spent time with Penny Gale, who's the General Manager of Engagement and Innovation, and Ben Flink, who's the Senior Manager of Business Innovation. And I asked them about their new initiative, the Innovation Station, and what it means for the future of the organisation. Well, the room that we're actually in is um, one of our kind of symbols that we're taking innovation seriously at the REA, and it's for our internal, uh, you know, 850 people who work here. So this was part of when we put together our innovation strategy, one of the things we wanted to do was actually have a space that looked different from other spaces in the building. If you looked at our normal uh, meeting rooms, they're pretty land, shall we say, uh, and a lot of them don't have any windows. So we thought, let's create a space that's light and airy, let's involve our own employees in actually putting the space together. So all the artwork you see on the walls was done by our employees. Wow. And this actually used to be the reception area. But we thought it's so important that people see that we're serious about innovation, that we ripped reception out and put that into our shop. And here, right in the middle of the building, we've created this innovation space. Fantastic. So... What is the goal or the role of the innovation department within RA? So the role of the innovation department is really future thinking. So we know there's a lot of changes that are occurring, you know, technological trends, etc. Um, also changes from consumers, changes in society. Um, so really our role is to incubate 
what we might look like in five to ten years' time. Is that a difficult thing to do, like look that far ahead? Or is that something that's you know, kind of naturally starting to, to be easy to think about? Well, I think everybody's doing it now. Mm. And I suppose what's different for us is how, how we are engaging with our members. So you'd have heard you know, the buzzwords like design-led thinking and human-centric design. So what we're actually doing is working with our members right at the beginning, uh, which is very different than how we used to work with them. So once you actually understand how that works, and it's a bit of a process, it's not really that difficult. The process isn't that difficult. But what's difficult is finding what you want to actually take a bet on and say, yeah, well, perhaps this is where we want to be in 10 years' time. So it sounds like we're, we're talking about two different things here. One is innovation within the organisation and the other is outside of the organisation. Yes. That must be a really challenging thing to be thinking about. No, that's why we put together a strategy. So we put together a five-year innovation strategy, which our board signed off on, and that strategy has got three planks to it. One is about how do we create a more innovative culture within our organisation? How do we bring people along with us as we innovate mm. and change? Because one thing that we all know is if you don't bring people with you, then the culture will defeat you. So that's been the focus for our first sort of year and 18 months has actually been on ways of skilling up and giving our employees a chance to kind of shine and, and get on board. The second strand is around external in terms of, OK, well, who's out there? Uh, because we only know what we know. Who are the entrepreneurs? Who are, where are the startups? Where's the new thinking? And who we want to engage with and collaborate to give us a much more kind of universal uh, feel and view of where things are going? And that, that's just a lot of fun, really, isn't it? Ben? Mm. It's not difficult. No, no, it's bringing the outside in. And so, um, and having just come from the New Venture Institute at Flinders University, I've had the pleasure of working with, you know, over 200 entrepreneurs over the last four years. So it's actually just inviting them in and bringing them into the organisation just to, to share their stories, share their thinking um, and also bring in new, you know, the technologies that they're working on or their new business models and sharing that with the rest of the organisation so we get staff going, oh, okay, that is a different way of doing that or selling that or, or a different way of looking at a piece of technology. And is the hope for that to also work with these entrepreneurs and startups to try and in, in sort of, I guess, encourage more activity for things that you're looking for? For as needs in the in the organisation. Yeah, it's very much about finding where our collaborators are and our partners because we know we can't do it alone. Mm. Uh, and we, you know, how could we compete? Uh, you know, with some of our products and services with, say, Amazon or or even Telstra or Google. So by ourselves, we need to be bringing in and working with kind of fresh minds and people are doing different things. Um, the other the other plank, because there's three planks of innovation here, the other one is around the sharing economy, and that's working with our members. So the whole, you know, if you look at us, we're kind of a community of 700,000 South Australians. That's a huge community, although a lot of them don't actually see themselves as members. Hmm. But how do we work with them to, for them to show us the way of not what they say when we ask them questions, but to understand their behaviour as they as they actually go along and do things? I would imagine that'd be quite challenging as an organisation to actually get your members to give you you know feedback and and all that sort of thing. Or is that something really easy? No, no I think it's fairly easy. Yeah. Actually. Is it? Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Well. In segments, I guess I would say. So there are some segments that are very much probably, I'd say, more passionate around being involved in what we're doing. And there are other sort of demographic groups who are probably less inclined to thinking as themselves as members or participating in that aspect. But having said that, I guess in our role, we're... We run, I guess, what I call customer discovery sessions. So for me, it's not um, – th- there is the membership and certainly engaging with them and that's working well, but it's also engaging with people who are not our members as well. So for, for me, when I say customer discovery, it's about just going out into the public domain and just finding problems that people want solved. And, and so I guess as long as you follow that process of just going out and observing, listening and, and solving problems that need to be Solved. Mm. You know, you know one, in a way, it's just another form of R and D. We can get really hung up on this word innovation, but the other thing that we have in our favour is that we have this incredible trust with the general public. We've been around for 114 years. You know, we're mm. the people who come and save your bacon when you're on the side of the road and your car's broken down. So <laughs> there's a t- tremendous amount of goodwill out in the community that a lot of our um, sort of competitors, w- whether in the more commercial uh, realm, realm, for example, insurance businesses, they just don't have that level of trust that we do. So we're incredibly fortunate that we can actually 
build on that and take that with us. Mm. And we talked about collaboration a little bit earlier. How have you seen, obviously, a company like this being around for 114 years would have started with their own sort of silo of this is what we are and this is what we're going to do, and you would have had to shift significantly across well, the board, I'd, I'd say, over that period. Except when you think about it, we have kind of risen on the back of the innovation of the 20th century, which was the motor car. Mm. So in 1903, when we sort of started, it was because there were early adopters of people who, who had the first cars in South Australia and they wanted to get together and show off and run race and, you know, have driving competitions, etc. And that kind of innovation is grew and grew and grew. So we naturally grew Mm. with it. Mm. We put in, it's like anything, if you look at Uber, if you look at Airbnb, when they first started those businesses was to solve a local problem. So we were solving a local problem. This group of people were solving it for themselves. So we started in the way that any entrepreneur really starts a business. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you're right. We just did that 114 years ago. That's right. It's amazing. So are you feeling now that collaboration is more important um, than yes. maybe in previous years? Absolutely. I think, um, I mean, I've been with the RAA eight years and um, our current managing director has been in the role here for 10 years. And I think it's it's fair to say that we, before Ian came along, we, we kind of saw ourselves as this sort of island. Mm. You know, we were the RAA and we didn't really have to play with anybody if we don't, didn't want to. But that's totally changed, I would say, over the last 10 years. We realise that it's not just about us and we need to find those partnerships and those collaborations because, you know, we've got older and big old organisations do get a little internal focused and we sort of realise, well, that's not the way the world is going and we need to get on that bus now. And it also brings efficiencies to the organisation as well because, like, I mean, I've been involved in the industrial clustering sort of thing, so where you bring multiple companies together to go and bid for high-value contracts and those sorts of things. So I'm sure that by collaborating with the right people, you, you're actually bringing efficiency into the organisation, yeah. actually broadening the, the oh, opportunities. Yeah. Well, it's like-minded people. Okay, so we wouldn't, because we have this reputation, which we hold incredibly dear to ourselves and close to our hearts, we're very careful about who we will collaborate and partner with. You know, there, there's an ethical and a values uh, in there for us. You've also obviously got such a large profile in the community. What are you facing in terms of challenges around what you're seeing is coming, but also maybe internally and in sort of getting that messaging of, of exactly what you are across the board out. Well, you haven't been with us all that long, Ben, so why don't you have a shot at that? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot, lot of things that are going on, and you're right. Um, so our, I've been here you know, less than a year, but one of my observations is that REA is actually open to change and is changing. So even mm. in the short time that I've been here, we've brought in new thinking about how we approach our strategic planning. And as a part of that, there's been a change to thinking about how we look at our different business units. So we've got multiple um, business units that are that are at different stages of scale. And actually, so now we're sort of rethinking about how we treat those different business units. So, so when you're talking about the efficiencies, if you look at our old businesses such as the roadside business or the insurance business, it's certainly about really commercially driven, getting really efficient, you know, exactly what we're doing in those businesses. Whereas we've, we're, you know, in, in terms of some of our newer businesses such as uh, travel or the secure services area, they're still um, quite small, you know, in comparison. And so they need uh, a bit more scope to to test things, to to grow, to scale, etc. So they need to be treated sort of differently. And then there's kind of where my role comes in is well, what's the next thing? Which is you know really at that micro level where we just need to have um, be open to experimenting. Um, so listening to uh, customers, to members, uh, finding those problems, and sort of coming up with ideas around how we might solve that problem. What aligns to what would work for us? You know, what are our core competencies? What we can do. And then sort of developing up, you know, what's the potential new business and then sort of testing that and piloting, uh, piloting mm-hmm. that. Are, are you generally starting that with a problem first or...? Yes, what is the problem to yeah. be solved? Yeah. Yes. But, um, you know, in terms of our insurance business, which is a really successful business in the state, and that's, as Ben said, it's a commercial business, but it comes out of the ethos of us being a mutual organisation. So we offer incredible customer service if you are mis- unfortunate enough to actually need to, to call on us. Uh, people 
sort of we have something like 94% customer satisfaction with our That's insurance amazing. business yeah. and we won't put up our premiums you know we we don't every year say okay they've got to go up again um, and and I think that that's driven from the board the board find, thinks that's very important but that's part of the reason why we're so successful you know you hear a lot of talk around um, if you put people before profit, the money will follow. I mean, a lot of commercial businesses, they find that really hard to do. But I think our insurance company is actually an, a great example of that. Mm. That's the beauty of not being um, answering to shareholders. We're not driven um, by profit. I mean, we do need to make a profit to be sustainable, but it's not the sh- we're not answering to shareholders to, to, to drive up costs for the customer. Mm. And the profits, you know, uh, from the insurance company go back into our members as well. I think why we have such a low turnover of staff at the REA, because it is such a great place to work, because people come to work with a sense of purpose. Mm. Well, I mean, you know, we've we've been talking with Mark, who's been here for 30 odd years, and, you know, you've been here for 10. And, you know, many of the the employees, it seems just when you you start, you don't want to go. (laughs) Yeah, I never thought I'd be here this long. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Um, So is there anything that you're working on now from an innovation point of view within the organisation that you're able to share with us? Uh, so the two um, key areas we are working on, so the first one is the sharing economy, so which is really connecting members to members and what might members want to do with each other. Uh, that's still at very early stages and, and there are sort of five key categories that are, that are in that sort of sharing economy platform. It's such a big area. So, you know, there's, there's lending things to people, there's doing things for people, there's moving people around, um, lending money. Um, so we're still at the very early stages of sort of discovering what our members would like to do with each other. The second part that we're looking at is both in terms of advocacy, which is um, certainly within Penny's um, business unit, but also innovation, is around the home energy. So it's very topical at the moment with the cost of electricity. Um, So again, we've been running some discovery sessions with members around what role we could, what problem we could solve for them in in the home and and the cost of electricity for them. Yeah, I think it's interesting though because um, there's actually nothing really new. It's about how you look at something and put things together differently. Uh, and, and that's really kind of what we're doing. Uh, and that's all about what is your business model. So when we talk about bringing collaborators in or doing that peer-to-peer sharing, which is never going to be our next insurance business, it's about, well, how do we run out, how do we do business differently than we've done it in the past? So we're, we're kind of examining, well, what could those different business models look like for the RAA, which comes back to the fact that we're not an island anymore. Mm. Um, and given that, and some of it's it's sort of not, some of the things we're doing is not kind of third horizon or um, like autonomous vehicles, which are 10 years away. We're, it's also about product extension. So we're looking in the home. We, we actually already provide security services in the home. We did some kind of engagement with our members and thought that there's some interest there if we actually put in kind of home assist, so tradies. So we've launched, last year we launched a new product, a new service, where um if you need a plumber or an electrician or a handy person, uh, we have a, a list that are trusted that you come to us and we get somebody who will go mm. out to you and we kind of look at that a bit differently. So we will do that within a certain amount of time. And, uh, you know, it's a really often frustrating when you get somebody in to come and do something around your house and they can't tell you they're going to be there between nine and five and they can't tell you when. Yeah. So we, you know, our aim is and what we're doing is actually improving that experience for our member or the customer. And that kind of feeds into the insurance as well, I would assume, especially around the fact that people have their homes insured with the RAA. Mm. Yes. And then to be able yes. to then say, well, you know, we can provide you a tradesman, you know, the, yeah, the, the water right. service yes. is smashed yeah. in my roof or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, and we're also looking at um, business improvement within the business. So as you can imagine, after 114 years, we're probably a bit – there could be places that could work better than they did. So we've got a big focus on over five years to find $13 million worth of efficiencies in our business mm-hmm. and try and get rid of the dead wood or where we're perhaps a bit more um, generous than we could be the way we run the business. Mm. So that's another area of focus for us at the moment too. Mm. And we touched on autonomous vehicles just a moment ago. 
that's obviously going to present its own set of challenges to a service organisation, mm. especially around the roadside mm. assistance and that sort of thing. And I don't think people actually realise how difficult that is going to make things. Oh, yes. I mean, that's really why we got on this whole kind of innovation bandwagon in the first place, because we can see what's coming. And it, we don't know exactly how long it's going to be, but it's probably not going to be as long as we think. I mean, if you look at the technology and cars improving it now, that with crash avoidance, mm. so that not just doesn't affect our um, roadside assistance business, but also our insurance. So you don't need car insurance anymore. So our two kind of pillars are definitely under threat in the medium-ish t- term. Yeah. Mm. And how's that sort of feeling in terms of what that future looks like? It's obviously quite a, a serious sort of threat to a couple of pillars of your business. But, but obviously this whole innovation department within the organisation is about addressing that and, mm. and really making mm. positive steps towards. Yeah, and, and our insurance business itself is really focused on this as well. But, yeah, it's an incredible threat and a, a fantastic challenge. Mm. And it's, it's, it's complex, it's un, unknown, and uh, so, so in my role it's about bring in entrepreneurs and startups who are who are playing in that space with new ideas, new concepts, new models, and really sort of exploring what role we might play in that new field. And so we've we've got to be in it to have some sort of role. So we've got to start, you know, running some experiments or trying some things in that space. And we're lucky that, you know, we're not going to be like a Kodak moment. We haven't got mm. our heads buried in the sand. We can see the future come towards us and, you know, we want to be well prepared, whether it's that the resilience of our workforce um, or having identified new products and services that well, we want to give a go. I can certainly see how that's sort of definitely with what I've seen so far with, with what you guys are doing is it's just so exciting. So if I'm a startup and, and you know, I want to engage with the RAA in some way, what are you guys actually looking for at the minute? Well, it could be anything. I mean, the thing about innovation is it's not just about technology. You know, you can innovate any way and anywhere. We figure that we will still probably be in the kind of business that we're in now. So it's probably going to be something about mobility or something about the home or, I mean, we went out and asked our members about a year ago, well, what, what's your why? Why are you a member of the REA? And they said it's about peace of mind. Right. So it's something that fits in and kind of reinforces what it is that our members are looking for from us. Mm-hmm. And are you looking for startups to come to you and, and engage with you? Is, Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. And they and they do um, every week. So, <laughs> <That's great. laughs> so for somebody great. that's listening to this now, um, you know, and they're based in Brazil and they've got a, you know, an amazing idea that could help you. Are you open to some internationals coming in and uh, and being involved as well? Well, that's a really good entry into think in talking about car clubs. So we're we're part of a global community, uh, which is the FIA. So we collaborate nationally with all the other car clubs um, across the states, but also internationally, uh, which is fantastic. So um, if there is a startup in Brazil, I'd certainly encourage them to contact their if they've got something in this space, they can come to us, but also to contact the... Um, who are they in Brazil? Yeah, there is an automobile association yeah, in, yeah. in Brazil yeah, yeah. as and, well. And yeah. we're all going through the same challenges across the globe, OK? You know, autonomous vehicles, connected cars, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to impact us all. So we are open to working on this together, actually. So how do we get in touch with you if, uh, if we need to? Well, just uh, you can send an email to innovation at raa.com.au and uh, we'll get back to you within... The, within the next day. Fantastic. And we'll, um, we'll put that up on the, the InShow website as well for anybody who wants to just go back and, and get that link. So that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Ben and Penny, for being with us Pleasure. today. Um, really inspired by what you guys are doing, not only within the organisation but outside of that and, and just encouraged by the fact that, you know, a trusted brand is continually reinventing. And I, and I think that's, you know, it, that inspires me because have been being in business for so long you know that constant reinvention is something that's that's often missed and i think that's really important for us to all hear about so thanks so much for joining us on the in show thank you it's david grice and troy sincock on the in show subscribe to itunes and listen to the in show podcast for more innovations up next we continue our chat with the raa an organization with over 100 years history about how they're adapting to the changing needs of future mobility and the new roles they've created 
Download the Phoner app before you head to your next event. Find people easier, market yourself better, and get connected using Phoner. That's spelled P F O N R. Phoner. Available in the App Store now. Hi, I'm Wendy Perry from Workforce Blueprint, and you're with Troy and David on The In Show. The In Show. Senior Manager of Future Mobility at RAA, Mark Borlace, has been working for the organisation for well over 30 years, but despite his experience, Mark finds himself in a new role, focusing on the future of the enterprise. Mark, you've been working in this new role now for around a year. Tell us what you're up to. So I'm in the public policy area, so we look at things that will affect our members and and form an opinion and eventually policy on it. Uh, So our role is to look at the real issues that we'll be confronting us probably three years out in a technology sense and and sort of a broader watching brief for technologies beyond that three years. So the things, the sorts of things we've been looking at are uh, autonomous vehicles and the the role that they'll play in the future and... um, the legislation and policy settings that need to be put in place for this to sort of tr- for us to allow tr- transition from where we are to uh, an autonomous vehicle future without leaving anybody behind. Mm. So you've been with the RAA for a long time? Th- more than three decades. So you've seen so much change across the organisation and, and also through you know tech and how it's emerging in vehicles now. Mm. What's probably been the biggest thing that you've seen so far? Well, I suppose it is the uh, the role that computers have played in cars now. So all of a sudden, it's uh, uh, it allowed a lot of other mechanical advances in in cars. Everything from airbags. Uh, you know, you've got to realise that even airbags, as commonplace as they are now, they make a decision that they've had it, that we're in an accident, and deploy the airbag in about 67 milliseconds. So, it's 100 milliseconds is a blink. So it makes that complex decision within less than a blink, and it's only possible because of computers. Fast forward to where we are now. Progressively, people are saying there's tasks associated with driving a car they don't like, and progressively we're handing those tasks to the car to do. Uh, the most simple example is cruise control. A lot of people didn't like you know, having to concentrate on keeping the car at one speed, giving that to the car. More recently, a lot of people don't like reverse parking. They've given that to the car. And over the next uh, five to ten years, we'll be in the position where you can give every task of driving to the car and effectively become a passenger if you want. Mm. We've talked a lot on the in-show about autonomous vehicles and particularly in flying cars and those sorts of things. Mm. And and, uh, it's just, um, you know, like I look at kids now, you know, that they don't necessarily, they may never, ever own a car. Um, in, in that context? Yeah, so the theories we're looking at is mobility as a service where they literally uh, they buy uh, mobility in the same way they buy a phone plan. They have a program or a um, package that they buy from somebody that, and all they literally do is say, I'm here and I need to be there and that's looked after for them. So if we were to do it in contemporary terms, if you were going from here to uh, maybe 30 k's outside the city, you put in that issue, the system would look at the best available options for you most timely, and then you'll get to your phone something that says, an Uber will be there in three minutes to pick you up. Uh, the Uber will take you to the tram, and here's your tram ticket. The tram will take you to this stop, and then you'll catch the Obam bus. And at the other end, there'll be another Uber and this will take you to your destination. So when you hit the button, you don't know how it's going to be delivered. These systems will deliver it for you, and progressively people will get much more confidence in that, and then all of a sudden you go, you know what, I really don't need a car. Mm. So how did you get into this? I mean, obviously 30-odd years in a, in a single organisation to, to go from where you began, mm. and, uh, and the, the, that journey must have been extraordinary for you. Well, the, the RA's uh, been a very good place. Uh, we've got 900 staff, so we're quite a large organisation. I started as a young engineer and was able to basically have six or seven jobs in the time I've been here. So I started around the time we were starting crash testing, uh, and now that's just commonplace, and progressively we've moved through. And what happens is uh, working for a motoring club, especially in uh, a policy area, you have to be very pragmatic uh, we can't be dogmatic because our membership is as wide as a community. Mm. So we have to take the community with us and part of that is finding pragmatic ways through uh, complex problems sometimes. And there's an element of trust that's been built up uh, between the RA and its members and I think that trust exists because of the pragmatic way we've approached things 
and have a history of, uh, of at least uh, giving people good advice or forming good policy that that everybody can live with. Mm. And did you ever re- um, sort of dream that you would you would be now in the at the forefront of technology in terms of your per- personal role? I've always had an interest in it, uh, and um, uh, being in this role when I first started here, uh, I actually started with a slide rule, so I've actually seen it from <laughs> the very basics of technology right through t- now to. Uh, what they call the, the HMI, the human machine interface sort of technology that are coming through. And that is mind blowing. And, and it does make you actually very interested in what the future holds because the ability for uh, computers soon to anticipate what people want and uh, deliver that is going to get much better as we get better at interpreting people's movements, their thought patterns, etc. So, yeah, no, it's a very, very exciting time. So how difficult then is it for you, you know, you talked about the fact that you've got to look three years ahead. Um, is it difficult to forecast that distance in time? Um, from the automotive side, it's, it's becoming less difficult. And the reason for that is that uh, the automotive industry works on a, probably a four-year product cycle de- development, mainly because there's a massive investment in it. Uh, you know, the, the investment to, to make a new vehicle uh, is billions and uh, they, don't, they can't afford to get it wrong. So they, they are, are, in fact, trying to anticipate what the market's in three years' time and start developing it now. So we're in contact with the manufacturers so we get a sense of what they're thinking. Uh, on the other areas, which is the way that mobility is changing, uh, that is with rideshare programs, with any of this community sharing where you know, assets that aren't used very much uh, are being traded, that's where the dynamic... Uh, part of it is. And um, what happens is that the RAA, uh, to, we've been around for 113, 14 years now for us to be around for another 100 years. We have to be uh, remain good at interpreting what members will want and what services are going to be available so we can actually continue to feed, fill that niche as it goes forward. Yeah. So how is this, um, you know, the future thinking then, how are you integrating that into the makeup of the of the business model that is the RAA right now? And is that a challenge for you across such a large organisation? Mm, it is. So one example is we've got an ageing membership. A majority of our, our members are over 50. Uh, so we know that they'll transition across into uh, retirement and into uh, assisted care, etc., and uh, as we know from uh, countries like China, where they've, you know, the one-child policy has meant that, that the service industry um, is really going to have to boom to look after these sort of people, we've been looking at uh, autonomous vehicle technologies for that industry, but not in the way that people probably think. We're not talking about cars that we see driving down the road. We're talking about very small pods that will move people around uh, retirement or assisted care facilities. Um, but you have to you have to get in at design stage of the facilities to make sure that these mobility devices have a role. So that's one example of how we're looking at the technology, seeing how quickly it is evolving, seeing what our members' needs are, and try to find a way of merging those two things together. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a serious, a serious challenge because you're not talking about just the automotive or the, or the people movement capabilities. You're, t- you're talking about the design and construction of these retirement villages mm. to enable this to happen. Mm. Are you starting to talk with builders along this, this sort of line? Yeah, so uh, in my role, uh, the last couple of years, I've been out uh, presenting to the Institute of Architects, uh, urban planners, um, traffic planners, Just, and I was quite surprised how originally how little they understood about how this technology was going to come up. So an example for uh, an architect might be, we've got cars now, the 5 and 7 series BMWs that will valet park themselves so what that means is you can get out at your front door and once it's been programmed to know the terrain it'll go it'll drive itself to the garage and park itself mm-hmm. there so a legacy of that is you don't need garages that are wide enough to open the doors with so if you're an architect and you're you're uh, putting uh, column distances in in a new building for that thing you may be making it so that it's over engineered or you know it won't be future proofed that's one very simple example. The other part about it is uh, for them to start to think more laterally about autonomous vehicles within a precinct. So everybody thinks that uh, autonomous vehicles, when they come, will be homogenous. They'll be used everywhere. They won't. They'll start in dedicated precincts where only smart cars are allowed to go. 
They'll be connected often by uh, intelligent parts of the transport system where they'll be able to drive, but once you drive off into s- other suburbs, it'll be the car's back to you to drive. Uh, some people say, you know, well, I like driving my car, and, you know, 100 years ago when cars overtook horses, cars had to go along slowly and they'd, you know, have a flag, etc. and progressively they, they overtook the horse. People still ride horses a hundred odd years later. Mm. You're just not allowed to ride them on the freeway. <laughs> so, so there'll be an analogy like that with, with what we call dumb cars. Or if you've got your sports car that you want to go for ride in the hills and all that sort of stuff, you'll still be able to do it. You just won't be able to do it in smart corridors. Mm. We touched earlier on, on um, policy and legislation. And um, I would imagine that there's some serious discussions going on around how you legislate with all of these autonomous vehicles and different things. What do you think is the biggest issue around that? I mean, is, is this something that the governments are actually open or are you fighting them with this? No, uh, the, the, in this sense, uh, we've been... Uh, us and the state government have, have had quite a collegiate approach and the reason for that is whoever gets the recipe right has an advantage of bringing those technologies mm. to market quickly. The the thing that the whole world's grappling with is is nearly every piece of road legislation around the world has uh, two words in it, which is called proper control. So it always says the driver must maintain proper control of their vehicle at all times. So the legal and technical argument is about what defines proper control. Traditionally, proper control is a cognizant person holding onto the steering wheel, managing the speed. The argument now is saying, is proper control systems that are proven and have redundancy who've got proper control of the vehicle at all times so the driver doesn't have to? And that's the thing that everybody's grappling with, how when you transition across from person being proper control to the car being proper control. Mm. And then the thing that I think about when we talk about all these autonomous vehicles and so forth is how cities are going to create revenue out of car parking if they don't need it anymore. You know, what, mm. is, what is going to replace that for a city? So I feel like that's a, a massive challenge for the bureaucracy to, uh, to try and um, get around. Have you seen anything across the world or with all the research that you do that, that is sort of paving that way to... Some of the areas that, are, that, are, that will develop this technology quickly out of necessity are places like Singapore and Hong Kong. Mm. You know, they've already had a policy of too many cars on their road. Uh, in fact, you have to buy number plates to allow you to get something on the road. In fact, the, 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 the number plates are often dearer than the thing you put between them. <laughs> so, uh, they, so they've got a, they've got a real uh, issue of, of trying to, uh, you know, by the middle of this century, making uh, their cities uh, carless. And that, so how do you make them carless? You make it so that the thing that replaces it, that gives them the flexibility, you want public transport and what they call first and last mile solutions, things that connect you to the traditional uh, public transport system, work frequently and seamlessly. So that you, uh, and, and smartphones is most of the way you talk with that. The hard part about it is how you take the older people uh, along with you. You know, I've got an elderly mother and, and uh, uh, I've got better chance of her learning uh, Cantonese than, than using a smartphone. So the system has to be uh, flexible enough to, to incorporate those sort of people as well. Mm. What do you see as the biggest challenges ahead of you now as, a, as an organisation in terms of you know, future mobility and those sorts of things? I think what we've got uh, from a membership point of view, it's always hard to get young people to take out roads because they're in a risk-taking part of their life anyway. Mm. Our marketers will tell you that where, we, where our membership normally grows from is the moment they have children. Right. All of a sudden they realise that they need to have the security of knowing their car will get looked after, etc. Uh, as we transition across to those sort of technologies that might allow you to an autonomous vehicle to take your son by himself to soccer and you follow them later and all those sorts of... Once mm. you get that sort of flexibility in, then you may... You know, we may have a, a, uh, an issue with, the, you know, reducing the relevance of the car to them. But, um, you know, if you look at our organisation, the traditional road service is less than half of our business now. So right. we are already transitioning across into services that they uh, need, so like security services, monitoring, 
uh, the, the insurance obviously will continue uh, mm. to uh, be around, and that in itself will change as, as autonomous vehicles have less accidents, etc. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, it's a time, and we've got an innovation team whose role is to work out uh, what innovations we should be following and how we um, basically remain relevant. Mm. Well, Mark Borlase, Senior Manager of Future Mobility here at the RAA, thank you for joining us on the In Show. And thanks for your interest. It's all about innovation on the In Show. And if you know an innovator that we should have on the show, just drop us a line at theinshow.online. You can check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Next week on The In Show. We're chatting to Leanne Isaacson. Now, she's got a background in traditional farming, but she's doing something new. She's considering herself a, a digital farmer, Troy. That sounds different. It, yeah, I, I can't wait to find out more about that. And you know what else? She's she's also Australia's most connected LinkedIn woman. Can you imagine what that would be like? Particularly as a farmer, you'd expect the most connected person to be you know, a very prominent Australian. You certainly would, someone with profile and so forth. But she's uh, uh, just an amazing woman that happens to have the most LinkedIn followers in Australia. And she describes herself as a connection creator who coaches people to connect. And next week, we'll also speak to Claire once more with more news from all around the world. No idea where she gets it from, but it's always interesting. And you can check out the inshow.online and subscribe to iTunes, listen to the podcast, and rate us five stars if you're enjoying what you're hearing. Well, I've loved the show this week, Troy. Um, Just hearing all about what's going on in in a traditional business that's been around for a long, long time. But we're going to finish up with Brad Chilcott. Now, he's the founder of Welcome to Australia. He's a pastor and a progressive thinker talking about what inspires him to pursue his passions and how he helps others. I actually just love being involved in people's lives, being improved, whether that's in small ways or, or big ways. You know, I love being involved where I can in the political process and seeing, you know, policy change and um, things that, you know, impact thousands of people. And I love being able to do a small thing like, you know, see um, a family come to the Welcome Centre and walk out with a, an armful of food, you know. I lo- like, for, for both of those extremes, I love being a part of it. So, to me, I think I am born with a lot of privilege that other people don't have and I think it's my responsibility to leverage that privilege in whatever way I can to to benefit others. The In Show, presented by David Grice and Troy Sincock. News by Shannon Corvo and Claire Murphy. Music by Zach Grice. Produced by Jason Walker. Subscribe to the In Show podcast on iTunes. A Dave and the Beanstalk production. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.